Today's guest is Avi Schleim. Avi Schleim is an Emeritus Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of the British Academy. His books include Collision Across the Jordan, King Abdullah the Zionist Movement and the Partition of Palestine, War and Peace in the Middle East, A Concise History, The Iron Wall, Israel and the Arab World, Lion of Jordan, The Life of King Hussein in War and Peace, Israel and Palestine, Reappraisals, Revisions and Refutations, and Three Worlds, Memoirs of an Arab Jew. Welcome, Avi. So honored and happy to have you here on this podcast with me. I'm so, very happy to join you uh, and very happy to have this conversation with a fellow Arab Jew. Yeah, likewise. Um, so I wanted to start by just asking you, you know, you've written so many books, you're a historian, and this last book that you wrote is more of a personal story, it's a memoir. Um, and I wanted to ask what inspired you to write this lens, what inspired this book um, to write more of your personal story, as it's a bit different than some of the other books that you've written before. Mm. The, this last book, Three Worlds, Memoirs of an Arab Jew, is very unlike all the other books that I had written before. All the other books were scholarly books, academic books. Um, and um, although I always tried to write not just for students and scholars, but to reach a wider audience. So I tried to write in a clear and accessible way. Um, and I've also written a biography of King Hussein of Jordan. That was easy because there was one central character and everything revolves around the central character. Um, but it was much more difficult to write about myself. And I hesitated for a long time before embarking on this uh, book. Uh, and uh, it's not a conventional autobiography. I like to, it's a hybrid. I like to describe it as an impersonal autobiography. The first half is about a family story, the Jew and the Jews in Iraq in the first half of the 20th century. And the second half is about me. Um, and um, uh, we moved to Israel when I was five years old in 1950. And my wife read the whole manuscript chapter by chapter. And when she got to chapter five, she said to me, I'm very worried. I'm on chapter five and you haven't been born yet. <laughs> uh, so it is a hybrid book in which I try to combine um, a personal account uh, with a family history uh, and to say that against the broader context of the Jews in Iraq and the even broader uh, backdrop of the history of Iraq uh, in the aftermath of the First World War. So it's a very, it's a hybrid book, which tries to combine the personal with the political. Beautiful. I love that. I'm actually trying to write my own book about Arab Jewish identity, and I know how hard it can be to write so personally, especially because it's such a complex identity. And I wanted to ask you about that, you know, this this title, Three Worlds, Memoirs of an Arab Jew, you know, this identity of Arab Jew can be so controversial. Um, and I identify as an Arab Jew, too. But all the time, you know, there's people who tell me like, that's not a real identity, or, you know, trying to kind of break that down and pretend like it's an illusion. So um, yeah, I wanted to ask you a bit about the choice to claim yourself as an Arab Jew and to also, you know, title this book and to have that so upfront. Um, how did you come to this identity? How did you come to this clarity? The title is easy to explain. Three worlds. The three worlds are Iraq, uh, from 1945 until 1950, Israel, uh, when from the age of 5 to 15, where I went to school, and the third world is England, where I went to school in London 
from the age of 15 to the age of 18. And the book ends, the narrative ends when I was 18, but there is a long epilogue which traces the evolution of my thinking about um, Israel-Palestine until the present day and the conclusion that I've come to and the reasons for my support today for a one-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But the subtitle is more problematic. The subtitle is um, Memoirs of an Arab Jew. Uh, and my academic discipline is international relations. So I used to be, and international relations deals with interstate relations, not with um, uh, identity. And uh, I used to be quite naive and think that we are given an identity and off we go. But in the course of writing this book, um, I uh, learned how complex and fluid identities are. Uh, and I also learned that our identity isn't chosen exclusively by us, but society affects our identity, our sense of identity. And society isn't always a benevolent force. In my case, um, it was Zion, the society was Israeli society and the Zionist movement when I moved to Israel, age five. So uh, originally, my family and I were Arab Jews. We lived in Baghdad. We were Arabs. We spoke Arabic at home and only Arabic uh, at home. Uh, our social customs were Arab. Our culture was Arab culture. Our music was a combination of Arab and Jewish uh, music. Our food was the food of the region. Uh, and there was no cultural gap between us and Muslims or Christians or any other minorities. We're essentially Arabs whose religion happened, happened to be Jewish, uh, uh, Judaism just as there are other, many other Arabs, uh, Iraqis, who, who had a different religion. But first and foremost, we were Iraqis. Um, and when we moved to Israel, reluctantly in our case, our Iraqi identity was erased, deliberately erased by the Israeli educational and propaganda um, machine. Um, and uh, in Israel, Israel was dominated by an Ashkenazi elite. And Israel was a very Eurocentric country, which looked, Israeli society, Ashkenazi society, looked down on the Jews from the Arab lands. Um, and um, Israeli society, the educational system, tried to erase our Arab heritage. Um, and also it tried to erase our history because there was Zionist history, the, his the history of the Jews in Europe, which was very Eurocentric. Uh, and at school, I learned a lot about Jewish history in Europe and about the Holocaust. I learned nothing about the rich history of the Jews in Iraq or the rest of the um, Arab world. So in Israel, uh, my Arab identity was erased and I was given another identity as a new Israeli, uh, as a self-confident, uh, self-reliant, uh, um, uh, liberated Israeli. But I never felt entirely happy in this identity which was foisted on me. And when I started writing this book, I reinvented myself, or rather I rediscovered um, my Iraqi roots. And that's when I began to define myself as an Arab Jew. And I'll say this, uh, Israel has no right to define my identity for me. I identify my own identity, 
and I now define it as my initial identity as an Arab Jew. Um, of course, this was became more complicated. I also acquired an Israeli identity and a Zionist identity and a British identity, but my original identity, uh, which is all important to me because that was the formative period, is that of an Arab Jew. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this process of Israelification, which is really about, right, like wiping away the history that was before and just adopting this new identity, you know, towards the end of your book, you had this line that was really beautiful. And you said that, you know, the there wasn't just the partition of Palestine, but there was also the partition of the past, you know, a, a way of, of actually like segregating specifically also between Jews and Muslims and, and just wiping away um, this, this history that was there. And now it almost feels like an impossibility. Um, so I'm wondering if you could take talk a little bit about this partition of the past. The past is very important. And the past is not another country. And you cannot draw a line behind the past and start here and look forward. Because the Arab-Israeli conflict, like any modern conflict, has its roots in the past. Um, and um, you cannot understand the present unless you understand the historical roots. And um, in America in particular, where history isn't much studied and isn't much valued, there is a more pragmatic approach to the present. Um, people are expected to choose, in this context, um, Israelis and Arabs, heroes and villains, and to make up your mind and to take sides, to choose a tribe. But I don't think that's a good way to educate young people. I think the way to educate them is to teach them the origins of the conflict, to teach them proper history, and then to leave them, once they've understood how the conflict has evolved, then they can, dis then they can take sides from an informed um, uh, position. And I'm a historian, so uh, education is really important to me. And here I, I see, not only from my own experience at school in Israel, but the subsequent history of Israeli education, it's very Israel-centric as well as Eurocentric. Uh, and it uh, portrays the Jews and Israelis as the victims of Arab hostility. And that's an ace historical view. The American Jewish historian, Salo Baron, coined the phrase, the lacrimose version of Jewish history. That is, uh, Jewish history is a never ending chain of hatred, hostility, discrimination, persecution, culminating in the Holocaust. He, he doesn't accept this as a true version of Jewish history, but it's a telling phrase, the lacrimose version of Jewish history, which portrays the Jews as always the victims uh, and the outside world as always hostile and antagonistic. Now, I'm prepared for argument's sake, to concede that uh, Jewish history in Europe, by and large, conforms to the Lacrimus version. Um, and, um, but I strongly deny that the Lacrimus version of Jewish history uh, applies to you or my history, that it applies to the Jews in the Middle East. We had a totally different history completely different history. Um, and uh, in Iraq, there was a long tradition of religious tolerance. Uh, in Iraq, there were always many different minorities. Uh, there were Christians, there were Catholic Chaldeans, there were Turkmen, Assyrians, Yazidis, 
um, and there were Jews. And the Jews were only one minority among many. Um, and um, Iraq did not have a Jewish problem. Europe had a Jewish problem. Uh, Zionism was the answer to the Jewish problem in Europe. That is to say, the Jews were a minority everywhere, and they needed to have a state of their own where they would be sovereign. Adolf Hitler had a solution to the Jewish problem, a macabre solution, the final solution. Uh, in Europe, the Jews were the other. Um, it was us and them. And, and Christianity was the, la the main source uh, over the centuries of hostility to uh, the Jews. The Holocaust happened in Central Europe. Um, uh, it didn't happen in the Middle East. Anti-Semitism was exported from Europe to the Middle East. And it is quite revealing that there was no anti-Semitic literature in um, the Middle East. Um, and it, after the First World War, when anti-Semitism spread in Iraq and other country, Arab countries, uh, anti-Semitic literature, like Adolf Hitler's autobiography, My Camp, had to be translated from European languages. So to conclude, um, Jewish history has always had a Eurocentric view of the world. And this Eurocentric uh, outlook was imposed on our history. Um, and therefore, it's a uniform history where the Jews are always victims and always subjected to anti um, anti uh, uh, Semitism. And I would like to reassert our right to write our own history. And this is what I've tried to do in this book. Uh, Edward Said, who was a great influence on me and a friend, uh, called his Wreath Lectures permission to narrate. He was a Palestinian. Uh, I'm an Arab Jew. And I not only ask for permission to narrate, I've exercised my uh, right to narrate our own history. Um, this is what I've done in this book. I think that's really powerful because, you know, you are a historian. And as you were sharing, I was just really feeling this commitment to the truth, right? Like, well, what really did happen? And I think that's really hard. Um, to do with all the Zionist propaganda that especially a lot of Jewish people and especially a lot of Jewish people who grow up in Israel, Palestine, right? Like there's so much propaganda narrative. And especially as you said about this history of anti-Semitism um, and the way that it was exported into the Middle East. But, you know, a lot of times the, um, I, you know, people will kind of fight me back when I claim myself as an Arab Jew and will assert this narrative of like, Actually, there's a long history of anti-Semitism, and then they'll cite examples like, you know, the Farhud or all these other bombs that happened in Iraq and in Baghdad. And I was just so struck um, in this book, but not just in this book, throughout your whole career, you know, you had such deep dedication to examining, well, who really was behind these bombs and these attacks and, and what really did happen um, and how did the Jewish community from Iraq leave? Um, so I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit both to the research that you did around right these um this fear tactics that the Jewish community suffered from and and how you came across all this investigation there is a Zionist master narrative which says that anti-semitism in the Arab world was perennial an endemic. Uh, it existed at all times and in all Arab countries. And after the Second World War, there was a real danger of a Holocaust perpetrated by Arabs against Jews in their countries. And the newly born state of Israel valiantly went to the rescue 
and offer them a safe haven from persecution. And that's how they ended up in, in Israel. Uh, and that's a profoundly distorted view of what actually happened. Um, Zionism was um, a very single-minded and ruthless movement with a very clear aim, a Jewish state in Palestine, an independent Jewish state in Palestine. And the aim was to have a Jewish state over as large area as possible uh, with as few Arabs inside its borders as possible. So it was a racist project from the beginning, a country for Jews only. And in 1948, Israel carried out the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Three quarters of a million Palestinians, more than half the Jewish population of Palestine became refugees. And the name Palestine was wiped off uh, the map. And Zionist, the Zionist narrative says that the Arabs left of their own free will or on orders from the uh, leaders um, and in the expectation of a triumphal return. So Israel didn't push them out and Israel is not responsible. Um, and uh, this is simply not true. And Benny Morris has completely in his work on the origins of the Palestinian refugee problem has completely demolished the Zionist version. He drove a coach and horses through the Zionist claims that the Arabs left of their own accord. And I belong to a small group of Israeli historians, and we used to be called the New Historians or the Revisionist Israeli Historians. And the group uh, included Benny Morris and Ilan Pate. And collectively, we are known as the New Historians. And between us, we all, all of us published books in 1988, on the 40th anniversary of the creation of Israel. We published books in English based on archival research, um, which challenged the Zionist version. So our books were a frontal attack uh, on the myths that have come to surround the birth of Israel and the first Arab-Israeli war. And Ilan Pape's uh, book was called Britain and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1948 to 1951. The conventional Zionist view was towards the end of the mandate, British mandate in Palestine, um, in May 19, for, towards May 1948, uh, Britain, after the UN had voted for the partition of Palestine into two states, one Arab, one Jewish, uh, Britain didn't want a Jewish state. Britain worked behind the scenes. It armed and incited and encouraged its Arab leaders to invade Palestine upon expiry of the mandate and to strangle the Jewish state at birth. Ilan Pape demonstrates that Britain was resigned to a Jewish state. Um, Britain was hostile to the Palestinians because the leader of the Palestinians was Hajamin al-Husseini, who was a renegade who had fallen out with the British. In British eyes, a, a, Mufti, a, a Palestinian state was synonymous with uh, a Mufti state, and therefore Britain colluded with, King, with its client, King, King Abdullah of Transjordan, to abort the birth of a Palestinian state, and this is what happened. So we say that there is a case against Britain towards the end of the mandate, but it's not that he tried to abort the birth of a Jewish state, but it succeeded in aborting the birth of a Palestinian state. And my book uh, was called Collusion Across the Jordan, 
King Abdullah, the Zionist movement, and the partition of Palestine. And I argued that by 1947, King Abdullah of Jordan and the Jewish agency had reached a tacit agreement mm -hmm. to divide Palestine between themselves at the expense of the Palestinians, and that is what happened. Um, King Abdullah sent the Jordanian army into Palestine upon expiry of the mandate and captured the West Bank and then annexed it to um, his kingdom. So we have written true history, uh, accurate history, based on research in the Israeli archives, British archives, American archives, UN archives, and primary Arabic sources, uh, which upends most of the claim of Zionist historiography. So the past is important, and being truthful and sticking close to the facts and to the evidence is all important. Yes, and you know, specifically talking about Iraqi Jews, right? There's that myth that you were naming about, you know, anti-Semitism having a long history and that it's based on religion and culture as opposed to historical circumstances, right? Where the anti-Semitism, as you were mentioning, was actually exported um, into Europe. And yeah, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about, you know, the Iraqi Jewish migration. And you were noting in your book that the migration to Palestine wasn't necessarily out of ideological choice, um, but out of necessity. And, you know, I was struck also by this line that um, you mentioned when you asked your mom if there were Zionist people in your family, and she responded, well, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the Iraqi Jewish community specifically and, and how this migration to Palestine happened, you know, and, and especially I was just really struck by the numbers um, that in the beginning, right, there were actually not that many of the Iraqi Jewish communities who chose to migrate to Palestine, but it was actually after there was multiple bombing attacks that then they chose to leave. So, yeah, I would love to just hear you share a little bit more about that work and that research that you did around that. So when I was working on this book, I used to interview my mother um, um, repeatedly and take down copious notes. And my mother died in Ramat Gan in Israel two years ago. She was 96, but she was lucid to the very end. And she loved talking about the golden age in Iraq. And my two grandmothers uh, used to talk in Israel used to talk about Iraq as Jannah Mal Allah, as paradise. Um, and one day, and my mother used to always um, talk about the wonderful, wonderful Muslim friends that uh, we had and how close they were and what good friends they were. And one day I said to her, did we have any Zionist friends? And she said very emphatically, she said, no, uh, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. Uh, uh, it's nothing to do with us. And that really uh, represented not just her view, but the view of the majority, of the overwhelming majority of the Jewish community in Iraq. And many of them were anti-Zionist. Some of them were neutral. They thought is, uh, Zionism is okay for the Jews we were interested in going to live there, but it wasn't for them because Iraq was their country and they wanted to stay. But if you look at the leadership and the mainstream of the Jewish community in Iraq, they had, um, if they are not hostile, they were indifferent to Zionism. Just a very small minority, mostly of religious Jews who believed in the Holy Land, actually wanted to leave and go and and, um, and move to Israel. But they were um, a, a minority. And so why, in that case, was the exodus? Um, and the Zionist answer 
is anti-Semitism. The Jews were driven by local hostility to leave, to um, seek um, salvation elsewhere. And they dwell on the Farhud, which you touched upon. Um, the Farhud was a pogrom against the Jews uh, in Iraq, in Baghdad, on the 1st and 2nd of June, 1941. Um, and Zionist historiography focuses on the Farhud as representative of the whole sweep of Muslim-Jewish relations uh, in Iraq. But it wasn't representative. It was a one-off. Um, it was a complex event uh, which had many causes. And as I argue in the book, the main cause of British colonialism, because there was a re nationalist revolt against the British, and then they sent forces back to Iraq to reoccupy Iraq, and the Farhud happened during uh, that period. And in many of the mixed neighborhoods, the Muslims protected their Jewish neighbors and hid them um, and enabled them to escape. The, the violence and the bloodshed. And there are many stories of Muslims helping their Jewish neighbors. There is a famous story of um, uh, an Arab woman married to a colonel in the Iraqi army, a Muslim woman who had her father, her, her husband's rifle. She stood outside the house of her Jewish neighbors and she stopped the mob from attacking them and harming them. So the Farhud wasn't a straightforward manifestation of uh, endemic um, anti-Semitism. It was a more complex uh, phenomenon. And after the, Far the Farhud shook the Jewish community to its core, but in the aftermath, the leadership concluded that it was a one-off, that it wasn't um, any manifestation of things to come, and that they thought that life would go back to normal. But then there was the Second World War, and then there was the birth of Israel. And I believe that the real turning point for Iraqi Jews was in the Farhud of 1941, but it was the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. And my mother said to me once, uh, when Israel was established, everything was turned upside down. Uh, that was the real change, because Zionism gave the Jews a territorial dimension for the first time in over two millennia. So now there was a Jewish state in Palestine, Arab nationalists, or Islamists um, who didn't like Jews could say to Jews, you don't belong here. You're not from here. You're alien. You're foreign. You um, are associated. Uh, you belong in Palestine with your uh, uh, Zionist friends. So uh, the establishment of the State of Israel made it easier for those elements in Arab society who were hostile to the Jews to say, it's time for you to go because you are not part of uh, this country. Uh, and um, after, and in, in 1948, the Iraqi army fought in Palestine. And when hostilities ceased, Israel signed armistice agreements with all its neighbors, but not with uh, Iraq. Iraq withdrew its army, but refused to sign an armistice agreement, and Iraq and Israel are still uh, officially um, at war today. So the reason for the exodus uh, was not endemic Arab anti-Semitism, it was the rise of nationalism, both Arab nationalism and Jewish nationalism uh, or Zionism. And the real turning point 
was the first Arab-Israeli war. You, you asked me also about the exodus, uh, which happened in 1950-51, uh, and I did some research on that. Do you want me to report the conclusions that I came to? Sure, yeah. Um, so in March 90, so I, I'll start a bit earlier. In the aftermath of the 1948 war, there was both um, hostility towards the Jews in Iraq at the popular level, but also hostility and persecution at the official level. The government began to persecute the Jews. The government began to dismiss Jews from government positions. Uh, the government imposed restrictions on Jewish merchants and Jewish bankers. It also imposed quotas on the number of Jews who could go to uh, university. And because of this persecution, many Jews, uh, thousands of Jews, began to leave the country illegally across the border from Iraq into Iran, and then they ended up in Israel. And to put a stop to this um, illegal immigration, in March 1950, the Iraqi government passed a law which said any Jew who wants to leave the country is free to do so. They have a year to register to relinquish the Iraqi citizenship, um, and they would get, they would uh, have to surrender their passport, and it would be a one-way visa to leave the country, but not to come back. And um, the only place that they could go was Israel, because they didn't have passport, they didn't have citizenship, and Israel was the pl only place that would take them, and Israel organized the transport, the air transport, from Iraq through Cyprus to Israel, and then directly, direct flights from Baghdad to Tel Aviv. Um, now, originally, initially, only a few thousand Jews registered to leave the country. Uh, when the law was passed in 1950, there were 135,000 Jews in Iraq. By the end of um, 1952, Around 125,000 Iraqi Jews had gone to Israel, and uh, just less than 10,000 Jews remained in Iraq, and they're unharmed. They continue to prosper uh, in Iraq. So the big question is, why the exodus of the entire community? Uh, and it wasn't a few thousand. The experience was that of the whole of this ancient community and successful community being uprooted. Uh, and I think that the main reason is the one I've given, official persecution of the Jews after Israel was created. But there were other factors as well. Um, there was a, an Israeli desire to bring as many uh, Jews as possible from all corners of the earth to Israel. Um, in 48, Israel carried out the ethnic cleansing of uh, Palestine, but the country was empty. There were only around 650,000 Jews, less than a million. <laughs> and they needed manpower very desperately. And um, um, in the year after the law was passed, five bombs exploded on in Jewish houses or businesses in Baghdad. And there are always rumors um, 
that I heard from my family, my relatives, and other Iraqi Jews in Israel, the rumors that Israel had a hand in the bombs to frighten the Jews to leave and go to Israel. And they didn't, those who went were put in Marbarot, in transit camps, and they weren't well received. They were also uh, sprayed with DDT, with pesticide-like animals. So it was a humiliation on arrival at the promised land. And that reinforced the resentment about um, the, the move. Uh, and the real question for me was, is it true that Israel was involved in the bombings? Um, and um, I couldn't find any evidence to substantiate these rumors, so I kept an open mind. But when I was writing my book, I met a, an elderly Iraqi, a friend of my mother's. His name was... Um, Yaakov Karkukli, and he was in the Zionist underground in Baghdad, and he told me about their activities, about the forging of documents, the forging of passports, the paying of bribes to get visas for Jews to leave. And the most um, um, disturbing thing that he told me was that one of his colleagues, Yosef um, Basri, uh, was responsible for three out of the five bombs. And he told me that the most famous bomb was a hand grenade lobbed into the Masoud Hashem Tov synagogue in which four Jews were killed. And that created a real panic. All the others were terrorist bombs to frighten but and cause minor damage to property, but no one was killed. So uh, Kalkukli told me that Yaakov, that uh, Yosef Basri was not responsible for that. And there was another bomb on a Jewish cafe for which he wasn't responsible. But he was responsible for three bombs, and moreover, that he was working under instructions from Israeli intelligence, from Israel. There was an Israeli intelligence officer called Max Binet, who was his controller, who directed him, who provided him with the TNT, with the uh, explosives. So. Um, I said to Kalkukli, this is all very interesting, and I believe you, and what you told me fits in with all the evidence that I have been able to collect. But your say-so is not enough. I need um, hard evidence. And one day he produced a page of an Iraq uh, uh, Baghdad police report about the bombings, which named Yaakov uh, which named Yosef Basri. It named uh, his assistant um, Shalom Saleh Shalom, and it um, um, gave a lot of details of what they said in the interrogation. So on the basis of this police report, I have concluded that Israel and the, under, the Zionist underground in Baghdad were involved in three out of the five bombs that caused the mass exodus to Israel. And this is a real indictment of the Zionist movement because um, even if not a single Iraqi Jew left for Israel because of the bombs, I would still think that this is a very serious indictment of the state of Israel because Israel was created to provide a safe haven to Jews facing persecution. It was not created in order to persecute and carry out terrorist actions against Jews uh, to destabilize them and to frighten them. And it most certainly was not justified 
in recruiting local Jews and turning them against their country and against their community and turning them into terrorists. So that's a really serious charge against Zionist, the Zionist movement and the state of Israel. And a few times you even called it cruel Zionism. And, you know, I'm also just, yeah, I find it so ironic that the whole Zionist narrative is really built around Jewish unity and how we're all one people, but how in the movement, there's actually so much betrayal, betrayal of Jews, betrayal of specifically Arab Jews, right? And, and just the trauma um, that that caused our communities is, is just quite immense. Um, and yeah, it's it's really hard to to really reckon with and to face like how could people who are claiming to be your people and are desiring your safety could could do something so vicious. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought that the historical evidence work that you brought um, was really important and really impressive, um, especially as you know you're saying that there's just so much propaganda that kind of washes everything away. Um, and I want to actually talk a little bit more about these psychological wounds that Arab Jews have, you know, of being caught between Zionism and Arab nationalism. And I was really struck by the characters of your mother and your father um, and, you know, the experience that they had coming to Israel, Palestine. And um, just, you know, you were talking about it as like emotional and psychological scars caused by being violently uprooted from or natural environment. So uh, yeah, I would love for you to just talk a little bit more about this trauma. Um, I'd like to um, start with cruel Zionism and then turn to the psychological trauma. Uh, I didn't coin the term cruel Zionism. Uh, someone else did, uh, an Iraqi Jew in Israel. Uh, but I think it really fits as a description of some of the actions of the Zionist movement. Um, and um, in 1954, there was the Lavon Affair. Um, the Lavon Affair was the name given to an Israeli masterminded operation in Cairo. It was a false flag operation uh, in which local Jews were recruited by an Israeli intelligence officer, planted bombs in order to create bad blood between the Nasser regime, which has just, ascend, uh, uh, just come to power in the West. But one bomb went off prematurely. The whole ring was rounded up, uh, including its controller. Uh, he was an Israeli intelligence officer called Max Binet. The same Max Binet who masterminded the operation <laughs> in Baghdad. And he committed um, suicide in prison. And no one can deny that Israel was responsible for this false flag operation. Um, and um, I discovered that it was the same intelligence officer. Uh, and um, this is another example of cruel Zionism, the, the Lavon affair. Um, and the point that I want to stress is that the false flag operation in Baghdad in 1950 wasn't a one-off thing. It was part of a pattern which reached, reached its climax with the Lavon affair four years later in Cairo. Uh, so the term cruel Zionism is justified because what was Israel doing here? It was taking good local Jews um, and indoctrinating them uh, and then turning them against their homeland, turning them into spies and training them to use terrorist methods in order to promote Israel's ends, which was Zionist ends, and not 
the welfare of the Jewish community uh, in Iraq. And these Jews paid the price. They lost their freedom, they lost their homeland, uh, and in the case of Basri uh, and um, Shalom, they lost their lives. They were hanged for their uh, crimes. So that's not a, what happened in Baghdad is not one of, it's part of a very cruel and single-minded and ruthless pursuit of um, Israeli interests. And the subordination of the welfare of the Jews in the Arab world to the dictates and the interests of the Israeli state. Yeah, and you know, there was a quote that you mentioned in the book um, by Ben Gurion, who says, whatever the world owes to the victims, they now owe to Israel as a way of really, you know, kind of, and especially in the Arab world, right, like projecting this, like long history of anti Semitism, but then all of a sudden making it seem like Israel is the one that's gonna kind of receive all the amends of anti Semitism in the way that that actually doubly just erases, right, Arab Jews and what was taken from us, um, right? Because it's actually not about our voice getting to be heard, but it, it's getting to be squashed even more. Um, and, and you know, something that I find hard sometimes, which I'm curious what your experience is, is especially in the Arab world now, it's like, how do we talk about anti-Semitism now that it has been exported and now that Israel has been created and that Zionism is continuously Right, like, wh where is a space to talk about um, Arab Jewish belonging into the wider Arab region and into the wider Arab world? And, and how do we assert our history that is not just Israel, but actually our authentic roots? But it's tricky because it's been so scarred by Israel. So it's, it's quite complex. And I think it actually um, really ties into this trauma piece um, and the way that the trauma lives in our in our bodies, because, you know, I think that there's very little Arab Jews that just simply grow up as Arab Jews in the Arab world, right? A lot of us have gone through the process of Israelification. So it's like to reconnect with our Arab Jewish identity, it's, we have to go through a process of like unlearning and an unmasking and, um, and, and that can be quite difficult. Indeed. Uh, and uh, to start where you started, um, um, ben Gurion, and before I come to Ben Gurion, um, I would say that the Zionist movement never showed any interest in the Jews of the Arab lands. The Zionist movement, and as my mother said, was an Ashkenazi thing. It was a movement that developed in late 19th century Europe. It was a nationalist movement, and it was a movement ban European Jews for European Jews. Um, and all the leaders of the Zionist movement, the founding fathers of Israel, they were European Jews, Polish Jews, Russian Jews. Um, and they tended to look down on us, on the Jews of, of the East, as being rather backward, uneducated, uh, rather primitive. Um, my mother went to the Alliance Israeli Universelle for girls, and she learned four languages, French, um, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. And all the teaching was, the medium of teaching was French. So she was far more Western and far better educated than the great majority of people from uh, Eastern Europe. So Zionism looked down on the Jews of the East until the aftermath of the Holocaust, which had removed the main reservoir for, for the Jewish state to be in Palestine. And after the 48 war, the top priority for Ben-Gurion was uh, Aliyah, um, immigration. Uh, and um, that was the top priority. Uh, uh, and they would have preferred European Jews. Uh, but 
uh, they were desperate for manpower and therefore not only encourage uh, Jews from Yemen, Morocco, I Iraq um, to move to, to emigrate to Israel, but they took active actions to um, create a threat to the Jews and to force them to move from their countries to come to uh, Israel. So um, there was this residual resentment about what Israel had done to these Jews. And there was also the fact that on arrival in Israel, they were treated as inferior. Um, and that added to the trauma and to the resentment of having been uprooted in the, in the first place. And Iraqi Jews, by and large, uh, did better in Israel than the other uh, communities, like the Moroccans, because the Iraqi Jewish community was the most ancient, uh, the most well-educated, the most prosperous, um, and the best integrated into uh, Iraqi society than any of the other um, uh, Jewish communities in the in the Middle East, but all of the Mizrahim, as we call them, the Jews of the East, faced, um, if not actual discrimination, a condescending attitude by the Ashkenazi elite towards them. And in the initial years, when these Jews ended up in Marbarot, in transient camps, which, with, which were really primitive, very poor conditions, very limited and poor quality food, dire sanitary conditions. These were very difficult years for them. Um, and um, the managers of the Marbarot were Ashkenazi Jews, who had no idea about our history, about our achievements, about our status in our societies. And they treated us as refugees who should be grateful for what we were getting and not complain. So it was a very difficult period of transition from being Arab Jews to being uh, Israeli. And as you said, it was a, a real psychological trauma. Now, in my family, my mother was much younger than my father. It was an arranged marriage. Uh, and I think women generally are more resourceful than men. So my mother adjusted. She learned Hebrew. And when our money ran out, she went to work as a telephonist in the town hall. And she became the breadwinner for the family. My father, who had been a really rich, very, very rich merchant in Iraq with very high social status, um, uh, arrived in Israel. He didn't know Hebrew. He was 50 years old. Uh, and he tried a couple of business ventures, and he was cheated. And his money ran out. And then uh, for the rest of his time in Israel, until his death, he was unemployed, and he was silent. He was a broken man. He never got over the transition, and he was silent, and he never talked about the past. So I know relatively little about the history of his family and his history, because he wouldn't talk. Uh, and I joke with my daughter, Tamar, that... Uh, my father was completely silent, and her father never stops talking. <laughs> well, at least you have the stories to share, you know, I mean, and that passing down of that lineage, I think that's beautiful. And, um, you know, I think that's the story of actually so many Arab Jews. Like I know with my Kurdish grandparents, they also, they just don't talk at all about, they came also in the 50s and 
um i mean so many families where it's they just pretend that you know whatever was in the past is in the past and we don't even open the door to look at it um but something that i found quite interesting is that you know you start your book with this story of your relationship to your dad and how your dad came to pick you up from school and was speaking arabic to you um in ramat gan in israel and um just the shame that you felt around having you know a, a father that speaks arabic and i was just so struck by it because you know i was born in jerusalem in 1992 like many years after and just i had such a similar experience growing up in jerusalem where there was so much shame around coming from a family in which you know your family spoke arabic or listened to arabic music and 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 this shame was like so debilitating like you know even for me i would always try to cover it up try to pretend like you know we didn't have any of that in our home um and and I, it was just really quite startling to actually see those parallels and narratives um so many years later yeah yes yeah indeed shame was something that i experienced very acutely um in israel on account of being an iraqi boy uh and the opening episode in my book is the one you just mentioned that my father uh comes to pick me up from school uh, and he looked alien because it was summer my friends and i were wearing shorts and sandals and along comes my father in a tailored three piece suit a white shirt and a tie and he starts speaking to me in arabic and i wished that the ground could have swallowed me up i was so uh, embarrassed and ashamed and i replied in monosyllables i didn't make any sense uh, and i wanted to say dad it's okay to speak arabic at home but in fr- in front of my friends i would rather you spoke to me in hebrew but he couldn't speak hebrew and as a 10 year old boy I didn't realize how humiliating the experience must have been to him but his silence and inability to speak Hebrew uh, w- w- was something that didn't change uh, and it defined my relationship with him uh, f- uh, for the rest of his life because we didn't have a common language and the only common language was Arabic which I was ashamed to speak and reluctant to speak um so that was one of the problems of adjusting to israeli society um the changing linguistic landscape but in my case uh i had not one exile from iraq but two and when i was 5 we moved to israel a new society very different society uh, and i had to learn a new language and when i was 15 i was sent to school in england so that was a second exile a new society and i had to learn english so i learned english i had failed english at school in israel which is why i was about to be thrown out of high school and was sent to um england so um my life uh, is not all that interesting in itself but it, it says something about the wider phenomena for Jews from the middle east of displacement exile um and um alienation Yeah you know and I'm I'm just also struck by the intergenerational trauma and the way that it's passed down you know you're speaking about your dad being a broken man and then in the book you're talking it as a child you just couldn't focus in school like you just couldn't you know for whatever reason and nobody really knew the answer and there was also the story that really um stood out to me um and made me really it was really heartbreaking in which your teacher asked you to take off all the jewelry because that was like the signifier of being arab you know is wearing the gold jewelry is is you know that is kind of part of the culture and and you know being asked to take that 
um, off in class and, and just that levels of shame. So um, it's quite intense. And, you know, I think there's something actually quite interesting and liberating about your story, you know, that as a child, you couldn't succeed in the Israeli schools, but there was always something in you that knew you could succeed. And, and especially as you were talking about also this desire to maybe one day end up in Oxford, and now you're a professor at Oxford, you know, there was something that was really emotional for me about that. Um, and, you know, I have my own life story, but just as you were saying, this parallel around Middle Eastern Jewish identity and story, but because I also grew up in this place where I, I, I really didn't think that my life would really evolve into anything meaningful, let alone international. Like that was way beyond my conceptions of what was even possible for me. Um, and, and then to, to feel that actually I could liberate myself from those con confines, which, you know, I think for both of us had to do with a, um, an undoing Zionism and an undoing of that, that learning, right. To find that, that more liberated view. Um, but yeah, I think there's something, you know, quite intense from going from that shaming and that confinement that I think, you know, many Arab Jews are still stuck in because I think the, the racism and then the internalized racism is so strong. And, you know, you also were talking about that a little bit in the book. Um, in the beginning, you had this line around how you came across Mizrahim and Arab Jews and the way that you look down on them, yet I was an Arab Jew like them. There's this quote, you know, that it's like, you know, you're conditioned to really look down on people who are your own. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to, to just hear you speak a little bit more about this internalized racism, what it meant for you to like liberate yourself from it, to actually find pride in your roots, um, to let go of that shame and, you know, it, cause, cause it's quite big. That shame is very big. And it's something that I experienced throughout my uh, time yeah, in Israel. Um, and I was not a rebel and I did not have a sense of my own ability. Um, uh, I did not think that I was any, I had any special talents and the society was keeping me down. Uh, I accepted the world around me as the natural order of things where the Ashkenazins were superior and they uh, ruled the country uh, and um, the Mizrahim were inferior. Um, I didn't never question that and I didn't feel um, and I didn't experience direct discrimination uh, but it was all in the air, the condescending, contemptuous attitude towards Arabs, the attitude towards the Arabic language, which now I think is a, an incredibly beautiful language. At that time, I thought that it was a very ugly language and a primitive language, and I was ashamed to, to, uh, to uh, uh, speak it. So as an inferiority complex defined my relationship with Israeli society. Uh, and you mentioned the incident at school when the teacher told me to take off my ring and my uh, chain with the star of David because that was a signifier of being a Mizrahi. She herself was a Jew from Germany uh, and a, a Zionist. Um, who didn't, and um, she was never wore any makeup, uh, but she picked on me and she humiliated me in front of the whole class by telling me to take off um, the the ring and the, the, the chain. So I felt that she was hostile to me and she didn't really understood anything about where I came from because she was so European, so German, um, uh, but there was another incident when I was 14 with that same form teacher because I had passed a, nation, a national test, which is more like an intelligence test. And um, I wasn't expected to pass because I was such a poor student in class all the way through. Uh, and I passed. And she discussed the results for the whole class in front of the class. 
And then she came to me and she said to me, I hope you realize that you only passed this exam. It was called the Seker. I hope you realize you only passed the exam because of the concessions that are made to the uh, Oriental children. And I didn't reply. And I was very angry then. I, I didn't say anything, but I thought, why is she saying this to me? Because it wasn't a school test. It was a national test. And I passed it. All she had to say to me is congratulations. Well done. That's all. But she said, I hope you realize it's only because of the concessions made to Oriental Jews that you passed. So she couldn't have known, because it was a national test, why I passed, and whether it's because Oriental Jews were given 10% margin. Uh, uh, I, um, and in any case, that really convinced me that she was a racist, and that she thought that because I was an Iraqi, I was inferior, and I was stupid, and it was by fluke or by positive discrimination that I passed uh, this test. So it, it wasn't a very good way to end my school education in Israel. Yeah, you know, and the story of Iraqi Jews specifically is in some ways such a story of going from riches to rags, right? And, you know, I mean, even just as you're describing as, you know, your family had to get rid of everything that they had and your mom tried to save the Persian carpet and the diamond rings and all these different things and and really to come to Israel where, um, yeah, there was so much shaming and so much uh, ridicule um, and so much uh, just blatant desire to erase um, the not just like the roots and where we come from, but also the beauty of it. Um, and... Yeah, I, I wanted to also ask something about um, where we are today, um, because, you know, I think that there are a lot of Arab Jews who have kind of gone through this process of unlearning, of reclaiming their identity, of deconditioning themselves from Zionism. But also, sadly, there's also a lot of Arab Jews who really um, just are instilled by the Zionist propaganda and have become more and more right wing. And you, you touch a bit about this in your book or how the resentment um, from the Ashkenazi establishment, you know, sort of pushed Mizrahim and Arab Jews to be more right wing and to vote for parties that, you know, their policies were directly at odds with our own interests. Um, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about this phenomenon around right this like right wing Idea, like ideology, um, because, you know, it wasn't there in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even. Um, it was only something that kind of developed later. But nowadays, it's it's pretty pervasive and um, pretty concerning. So curious to hear your perspective on this. You're right to point out that attitudes in Israel had changed, and the Mizrahim gradually reclaim their own heritage um, and are, are proud of the Arab heritage. And uh, there have been many mixed marriages in Israel. So the children of these mixed marriages, by and large, are not ashamed of the Mizrahi, uh, the Mizrahi roots, but are proud uh, of them. Uh, and I know in Ramat Gan, not just in Ramat Gan, that there are quite a few uh, Iraqi singers who were born in Israel, but they are singers in Arabic, uh, and they have co concerts uh, in Arabic. So there's been an improvement uh, in reclaiming the heritage of the Jews from the Arab lands. The same is true of Moroccan Jews and their culture um, and their music. Uh, that's a very positive uh, development. But the um, negative development is the one that you mentioned, which is so many Mizrahim vote for right-wing parties. Uh, Israel today is maybe more than 50% people of um, 
uh, Mizrahi roots. Um, but the majority of Mizrahi vote either for right-wing parties or for Shas, which is a religious party of Oriental Jews. Um, and uh, I've often asked myself, why is it that um, people from the Middle East vote for right-wing parties? And the Zionist answer is because these people lived with Arabs. They know what the Arabs are like. They, are, they know that the Arabs only understand force. Um, and that's why they vote for nationalist parties. And I reject this explanation. Uh, I maintain that the Arab Jews were indoctrinated in Israel to hate uh, the Arabs. Uh, and furthermore, that they were a marginal group in Israeli society. And as a way of establishing the nationalist credentials, the, the Israeli credentials, they become Arab spurning um, and anti-Arab. And that's why they vote for nationalist um, parties. And there is a third factor um, that I would add to the explanation of why Mizrahi vote for right-wing parties. And that is that the labor establishment which uh, ruled Israel for the first three decades of statehood uh, was condescending um, towards the Mizrahi, almost contemptuous towards them. Uh, and, um, and that led the Mizrahi to vote for opposition parties. I experienced this as a 15-year-old boy. Uh, there was an election in Israel. I went to the central square in Ramad Gan, and I saw Menachem Begin, the leader of the Likud, the leader of what um, of Herut, which became the Likud, the right-wing nationalist party. He was a spellbinding orator, and um, I was attracted to him. Why was I attracted to him? Not because of his views about the Arabs, certainly not because of his, his right-wing social and economic policies, but because he his attacks on the Labour Party establishment. And um, uh, he exploited the sense of grievance and the resentment and the humiliation that many of us felt. And he spoke directly to us as brothers, as equal. So we identified with him and we, with his right-wing uh, uh, policies. So, uh, um, but this is a continuing phenomenon and it's an important phenomenon in Israeli politics because uh, it's the vote of the Orientals that has kept the Likud um, and the right-wing parties in power um, until, until now. And you ask, where are we now? Um, my answer is that Israel is a deeply divided society. Israel has become an apartheid state because of its oppression of the Palestinians and the colonial rule uh, in the West Bank. Uh, Israel isn't going anywhere. It's an apartheid state. Apartheid is not sustainable in the 21st century. There is no future for Israel with apartheid. Uh, so what's the solution? Most of my li adult life, I thought the two-state solution, an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza with a capital city in East Jerusalem. But Israel has destroyed the two-state solution with the settlements by encroaching and stealing more and more Arab land. Now there can be no viable Palestinian state or a, a territorially contiguous Palestinian state. All you have on the West Bank 
is Arab enclaves surrounded by Jewish settlements or military uh, bases. So what is the solution? By default, by process of elimination, it's the one state solution. And that's the one I advocate now. A it has to be a democratic solution. And I support a democratic one state solution. That is to say, one state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea with equal rights for all its citizens, regardless of religion and ethnicity. And that's where, that's my position today. I love that. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about Arab Jews as being the bridge identity, right, as, as bridging between the Ashkenazi Jews and Palestinians. And I'm curious if you have an understanding of or a vision of, you know, what Arab Jewish and Palestinian solidarity could look like, um, you know, how, how do we, you know, because I think for me also, sometimes it's like, the all the narratives are around but the Holocaust and the Nakba and the Holocaust and the Nakba, and they're both very important to talk about and address. And Arab Jews bring a completely different story, you know, and the Holocaust and the Nakba in some ways are both of our stories, but also neither of our stories. So, so we're kind of in this wedge. Um, and yeah, I'm curious if you have thoughts about what Arab Jewish and Palestinian solidarity could look like today. I've always hoped that um, Mizrahi Jews would be a bridge between Israel and the Arab world. But they've never been used as a bridge. Um, and uh, they've been indoctrinated uh, in the ideology of the conflict, that this is a permanent conflict to which there is no peaceful uh, solution. And um, uh, uh, Mizrahi Jews have not held positions of real power where they can influence Israel's policy towards um, the rest of the uh, uh, Middle East. And the identity of an Arab Jew is denied by um, Zionists and by um, mainstream Israelis. Uh, my book has received many accolades, but also very hostile comments from Zionist Jews, um, because I am the living embodiment of something which they deny. They deny that there is such an identity as an Arab Jew. It's all bipolar. It's all black and white. It's one. And um, they say uh, an Arab Jew is an ontological impossibility. If you are a Jew, you cannot be an Arab. And if you're an Arab, you cannot be a Jew. So I'm a problem for them. And you are a problem because you are a, 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 an Arab Jew. But what I want to say now, today, uh, and looking to the future, um, is that there can be no peace in the Middle East until Israel comes to terms, until Israel has a reckoning with the suffering that it has um, inflicted on the Palestinians. And Israel has never acknowledged um, that the birth of Israel involved a monumental injustice to the Palestinians. Israel never accepted responsibility for the refugee problem. And how can you resolve this conflict uh, unless Israel uh, accepts its responsibility, its historic uh, responsibility? So looking to the future, I'd like to see Palestinian-Israeli solidarity, Muslim-Jewish harmony. Um, and um, for me, Muslim-Jewish harmony um, coexistence is not an abstract concept. Uh, it's what my family and I touched, experienced. It was the everyday reality 
in Baghdad, and there was nothing unusual about it. Uh, this coexistence has ceased since the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, in 1950, as I mentioned earlier, there were 135 Jews, 1,000 Jews in Iraq. Today, there are three Jews left in the whole of Iraq. So Israel has been a polarizing force, Israel and the Arabs, Jews against Muslims, Hebrew against Arabic. Um, and I would like to hark back to an earlier phase in the history of the Middle East where there are open borders, where there wasn't these entrenched uh, tribal uh, loyalties. So uh, looking back at my own history and reanimating the Jewish civilization of the Near East, uh, that prevailed in the first half of the 20th century enables me to think of a better future for our region. Enables me to think that the antagonism between uh, Arabs and Israelis is not preordained. It's not inevitable. It came about because of the rise of nationalism. Nationalism is a problem. Nationalism is a very destructive and divisive force. Uh, patriotism is different. You can be, if you're a patriot, you love your country. But if you're a nationalist, you have to have an enemy and everything is geared to mobilizing against the enemy. Nationalism is a terrible thing. Um, Marilyn Monroe wrote in her scrapbook, nationalism stops us thinking. And nationalism stops us looking at other people as human beings. We only see them as enemies. That's what nationalism has done. It's at the root of this conflict. And doing away with or eroding nationalism, eroding national barriers, is the key to uh, a better future. Amen. You know, you were reminding me also in one of the scholarships I was reading about how Arab Jewish uh, identity is not just a nostalgic identity of looking to the past, but it's also a prophetic identity of looking into the possibilities of the future, which is to right, take down all these rigid walls, both physically and mentally that have been created. So my last question for you um, is just what advice would you offer to other Arab Jews, perhaps younger folks who are reclaiming their identity, who are looking into this history and you know, trying to understand who they are and where they come from? What words of wisdom do you have to offer? It's important to remember the past. Uh, and um, that's what I've been talking about for the last hour. Um, and if we look at the past, we discover parallel histories. The Palestinians were displaced in 1948. Three quarters of a million Palestinians became refugees. That is the Nakba, the catastrophe. Uh, but Zionism had two categories of uh, victims. One of the obvious one, the Palestinians. But there was another category of victims, and that is the Jews of the Arab lands. We also suffered. Um, we also um, uh, paid the price for the establishment of the State of Israel in the heartland of the uh, Middle East. Um, so we also, the Palestinians are real refugees in every sense. Uh, we may be described as refugees, but at the very least, we are victims of the Arab-Israeli conflict. We are displaced as a result of the conflict. So what we, we should look at now is not what divide us, which is what Israel does, 
by emphasizing the conflict all the time. What we should look at is what unites us, which is uh, a Middle Eastern culture uh, and uh, a common experience of displacement. Uh, the pos look at the possibility of coexistence and not just separation um, between Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza uh, and Israel, which is the two-state solution, but creative coexistence with Palestinians, between Israelis uh, and Palestinians. So uh, what uh, I would encourage is a dialogue between Mizrahim and Palestinians in Israel, the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel, and the broader Palestinian uh, community. And the party that I used to support, Meretz, which is a very dovish Israeli party, was eliminated at the last election. It didn't meet the necessary percentage to have representation in the Knesset. Uh, and But now there is a new party. It's called Kol Ezracheha, all its citizens. And it was registered as a political party before the last election, but it hasn't been launched. It's just registered as a party. And I think, and this party is one of, um, based on genuine equality between Israelis of all stripes uh, and Arabs uh, in Israel. And I think uh, for me, that is um, the way that, um, Mizrahim and Israeli Arabs should go, cooperation um, and joint political uh, activity. Uh, and I hope that this party will grow and grow and that it would um, um, blaze the trail for a new kind of Israel. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking all this time and sharing all your wisdom. It was such an honor to sit here with you. Before we close, just wanted to ask if there's anything that we you didn't talk about yet that you want to make sure to include or just anything that um, we didn't get to that you want to make sure we do. Uh, there's nothing else that I want to add except to say thank you for reading my book. And thank you for bringing up so many issues. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure to talk to you uh, because there are very few young uh, Arab Jews. And um, it's a genuine pleasure to have this kind of open uh, conversation about our roots, about our present issues, and uh, hopefully about a better future for our region. Yes, amen, Thank inshallah. Thank you so much, Avi It was so lovely to sit with you. Um, for all the listeners, if you want to learn more, you can read his latest book, Three Worlds, Memoirs of an Arab Jew. And thank you so much for listening.